So, uh, may I have your attention, please? You'd be seated, I'd be most grateful. Thank you. Uh, this is the Emil Bustani Middle East Seminar. It's in its 21st year. Um, we have two sessions this semester only, our first today, and then again on March 20th, in this room, at this time, 4.30 or so, uh, Dr. Kenneth Pollack, who is Director of Research at the Saban Center of Middle East Policy at Brookings Institution in Washington. A number of you know him through his work on Iraq and war and on Iran. He is coming to talk about Iran, war or peace. And you're all invited. This is open to the public and I hope you'll be able to join us. It's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Gilbert Burnham from Johns Hopkins from the School of Public Health. He is co-director there of the Center for Refugee and Disaster Response. Uh, he is a professor of medicine, and he has enormous experience, as I'm learning, uh, around the world. Began his career in Malawi, has worked extensively in East Africa, has done work in the, in the area of public health and medicine in Lebanon, uh, in the Palestinian camps, and elsewhere around the world. And I guess he's best known to us uh, these days for his work, his research, uh, on uh, how you count the dead in Iraq. It's a kind of gruesome, grim topic. Uh, he published an article in October of 2006 in The Lancet, the British Medical Journal, uh, that got tremendous attention in this country and elsewhere, and has, of course, been contested, I yeah. gather, in Washington and other, not all of Washington, but in <laughs> some sectors in Washington. And so we thought, and I thank my friend, the executive director of the Center for International Studies, which sponsors this uh, with the Technology and Culture Forum, uh, John Terman, for bringing uh, Gilbert Burnham together with me in, in, into this seminar. So we're delighted to have you. Good. It's your show, <coughs> and uh, I'll just move over there so I can watch. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much for the introduction. And I'm going to stand up, as I usually do, because this is the way I look at whether my students are doing their emails or paying attention to, <coughs> to class. <coughs> but I bet I'm a bit cramped in style because uh, a week or so ago I was in Rwanda. I was walking along. I stepped on a grate. The grate gave way and dumped me. And uh, so I got this boot on. And uh, my colleagues flashed the message back to, uh, to Baltimore that said, Burnham's down the drain in Kigali. <coughs> so <laughs> anyway, so here I am. And it's a pleasure to, to be here and to talk about uh, the work that we did in Iraq. Um, and I just wanted to say a little bit about how we got started. And I think, John, it was about well, over a year and a half ago, uh, John called me up uh, <coughs> and in Baltimore, and we started discussing what was involved in repeating the mortality survey that Les Roberts and uh, several of us had done in 2004. And one thing led to another. And uh, I don't think I'm probably giving away too many secrets <coughs> to say that the, the entire study cost uh, somewhere less than $60,000. I don't think I've ever done a study in my life uh, for that kind of funds, uh, particularly out of, uh, out of uh, any kind of US government <laughs> funding. Um, so one thing led to another, and uh, that's what I'm going to talk about uh, uh, this evening. So we're going to talk about estimating mortality. And there's a team of four of us that were primarily involved. Uh, uh, Riyad Lafta is our uh, team member in uh, Baghdad, who carried out much of the field work. Uh, Shannon, uh, along with several people in our biostatistics department, uh, dealt with the statistical analysis of things. Uh, and then Les Roberts, who some of you may know, uh, was involved in the writing and the analysis of the, of the work. Um, so <coughs> it's all about numbers uh, and where commas are located and what does it really mean and so forth. Um, now. The, the question comes up <coughs> right away with this famous uh, quotation from General Franks, uh, we don't do body counts. And of course, he's absolutely right. This has never been the purview or the responsibility of military to count uh, civilians or others or even enemies uh, in, in conflict. Um, <coughs> so one organization did begin very early in counting uh, the, the uh, reports of deaths 
as covered in the media. And they have a website uh, and they uh, produce daily updates on these numbers as collected from a number of different media sources. But by and large, everything that we know about numbers of deaths in Iraq generally comes from counting the dead, whether it's counting the, uh, the American forces or coalition forces, whether it's counting uh, uh, Iraqis or others, it comes from basically counting bodies. Um, and as a result, we have a number of different uh, uh, figures and facts circulating around. Here we have something from the BBC that says the deaths among police has reached 12,000. Um, then we have an official uh, statement saying there are 50,000 Iraqis killed, 150,000 Iraqis killed in three years. This was later qualified to say 150,000 uh, Shiites, um, but that part didn't make, make so much news. Uh, one of the quotations came out of this saying that the mortuary was receiving 60 violent victims every day in this particular facility alone. And this did not include victims of violence whose bodies were taken to the city's many hospital morgues or those who were, which were removed. So already we see we've got a little problem if we're trying to account for the size of conflict just with the number of bodies. Um, this was the UN report of 34,000 here recently. Um, the Ministry of Health responded by saying the count was exaggerated and obtained using incorrect sources. And although the government closely tracks deaths through the Interior and Health Ministries, he said, it does not have a system in place for compiling a comprehensive figure. Now this is not surprising to us that work in health systems because one of the first casualties in any kind of uh, collapse of governance or any kind of conflict si si situation is the information system. This falls apart fairly quickly. And in fact, very few countries have had the, the level and the sophistication of the vital registration and health system that uh, Iraq had in the past. So it's not surprising that this was one of the early casualties in the conflict. Um, and there's something that just came up the other day. Americans were polled on how many civilians uh, were killed. And the estimate was someplace around 9,000. Uh, <coughs> although the Americans were really good at pinpointing the number of American or coalition forces killed, uh, they weren't so accurate on uh, how many civilians. Um, so how do we count deaths? There's a number of approaches for this that we could look at. Um, there are things such as, um, in a small situation, going to cemeteries, counting the number of new graves. This was done very extensively uh, in the, uh, when, when the Kurds fled to northern Iraq, and that's how we got our numbers, looking at the cemeteries, and that works in smaller situations. Uh, hospitals and mortuaries uh, often keep very good records, but getting those records up to the next level is something that doesn't work very well in difficult situations. Uh, some countries, not very many, but some countries have death certificates, and if the system is working well, you can track the death certificates uh, easily, and then there are accounts from family and military and so forth. So this is the usual way that we collect uh, information on deaths, but these work only in fairly small situations. Um, <coughs> now there are a lot of limitations to counting. Uh, vital registration systems usually don't exist. Uh, we take it for granted that in a country like the U.S. we have death certificates and so on, but uh, it was less than 50 years ago that the last American states started instituting death certificates. So it's a fairly new situation. There's not very many countries outside of the most developed countries that have this kind of system. Um, hospital statistics, which I work with a lot, these are prone to enormous difficulties. We've been very active in putting together uh, or monitoring the health system in Iraq, uh, sorry, in, in Afghanistan, and getting the information system to function even in the peaceful areas of Afghanistan has been a huge challenge. Um, <coughs> not all bodies are taken to the mortuary. That's a well-known situation. Uh, some counts are only looking for violent deaths. Some counts look for adults and not children. Uh, but if you're in public health, you want to look at causes of death uh, from a variety of reasons. So we're looking for what we call crude mortality or all-cause mortality. And many of the figures that we see about uh, Iraq don't include those as well. Um, <coughs> now the big hitch in all of this is you can't take numbers from mortuaries and hospitals and so forth and make those into national figures. 
that from a uh, public health standpoint, from an operational standpoint, is just not possible. You just can't move from one to another. So if you want to look at bigger estimates for an area, you have to move to a different approach to things. And <coughs> then finally, as we've seen already, when you have numbers, they're highly susceptible to manipulation. Uh, one of the things that came out of the study almost immediately after we released the study in October was the Prime Minister's office in, uh, in Baghdad said, no more da data on deaths except data that are released by the Prime Minister's office. So <laughs> that just emphasizes this point uh, down here. So if we're going to try to look at, um, at uh, evidence of death on a much larger scale than what we can just count in cemeteries and so forth, then we have to turn to survey methods. Um, and this is the, the backbone of much of public health. When you read about how many people are overweight and how many people have high blood pressure and so forth, these are all based on surveys. These are all based on samples in various ways. So in public health, we're used to doing sampling methods uh, on a regular basis. So we have a number of different ways that we could sample. If it's a small area, we could count everybody who was in this area. And then randomly, we could select a certain number of people to go to. Um, something we can't do when we're looking at a national approach to things. Um, <coughs> we could take every 10th household. But then we have to have some way to know uh, where we turn left and where we turn right and so forth. And that's OK if you're in a refugee camp. It's not OK if you're in a bigger situation. Um, so as a result, we use what are known as cluster surveys. And the way a cluster survey works is you pick out a certain number of clusters, and there are ways to decide this. We'll talk about this in a minute. And then you go to this cluster, and you find some place to start. And at that start point, you measure a certain number of people, a certain number of households, a certain number of villages, whatever. And using the information from those clusters, then you can apply that information to a larger population. And that's what's commonly done. Most of the data that you read about for immunization coverage in Kenya, for the number of people who uh, had fever in the last two weeks in Cambodia, it's all based on this cluster survey method, something that we've become comfortable using over the years and is probably the most widely used survey method internationally in, in public health. Um, <coughs> so we have to decide a number of things. How many clusters, which we'll talk about in a minute. How, what's our sample size? How many people do we have to measure? An interesting thing from statistics is that the number you have to measure is really not dependent on the overall population, but trying to figure out uh, what you want to show. What are the differences? What is the, the precision that you, that you want, to, want to demonstrate? Um, <coughs> then the population is listed. The population is divided by the number of clusters. And one of the principles that we always follow in sampling is we sample uh, proportionate to the population size. This is kind of epidemiology 101. Uh, so uh, everybody has an equal chance of being included. So that's one of the premises that we always try to follow. So how many clusters? I don't want to spend a lot of time with this. But uh, we know that as we increase the number of clusters, the precision improves. So the confidence intervals narrow. This comes from a study of nutrition status in West Africa where there were 150 clusters and they randomly selected various numbers of clusters. And when they got out to 60, they found they had uh, very good precision, but they found that 30 was enough for decision making. And this is one of the differences that we always uh, kind of argue about with, uh, with clinical medicine is, and that is in public health, uh, we're never going to know the true answer. Uh, that's just not knowable when we're talking about large populations. But we have to be able to measure things accurately enough and precisely enough to make the right decisions, even though we're not going to have the absolute final true uh, number to three or four decimal points. Uh, so if you're doing clinical trials of a new medicine, that's a problem. If you're doing public health surveys, we accept that as part of the way we have to do business. OK, this was our 2004 survey, uh, which uh, was published uh, in The Lancet. Um, Les Roberts was the primary author. Uh, he actually went to Iraq uh, to work with Riyadh on this. Um, Les spent most of his time hiding out in the basement of the hotel. 